Greetings, everybody. It's Mr. Doobs with Triforce Films, and I'm back again for another whip crack of edutainment with the third installment of... It's Making Tunes with Mr. Doobs. Yeah. If you've been following the series, you know that we've already covered the basics of equipment and recording. If not, feel free to chase these links for a spell and get yourself caught up. No, that's fine. I can wait. Ready to go? Then let's just dive right into our final mix! Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> so, we've become mostly familiar with the timeline window in the last episode. This is where we recorded all our different parts, one at a time, into separate tracks, right? And we were able to put together a pretty good recording. But the problem is that we spent so much time ensuring that our recordings were nice and dry and clean, that now the overall product sounds kind of dead. You see, out in the real world, that's just not how sound works. In normal environments, there's a natural delay and reverb caused by the reflection of sound energy on the surfaces around you. Now we're going to look at adding those natural effects back into our sound, which sounds kind of stupid because we just removed them, right? Creating a clean recording earlier ensures that now we can place our song into whatever environment we choose. It's allowing us to maximize the musical qualities we wish to put back into our final product. And that brings us to the mix window. The mix console is the second half of recording and mixing music, and it's where we'll spend most of our time in this episode. Take note that depending on what program you're using, the location and functionality of some of these processes may differ slightly. So it's possible that you'll need to familiarize yourself with those differences on your end. Think of it this way. What you saw with your tracks in the timeline window has basically just been turned on its side. All the parts you recorded are lined up in the same order, but now they're vertical instead of horizontal. Let's do a quick playback, and I'll introduce a few of the areas that we'll be using. Your eyes will be instantly drawn to these color bars dancing around hypnotically with the music. That's not a coincidence. Those are visual representations of the volume or loudness of each of your tracks displayed in real time as your song plays. Right beside each bar is the volume fader for each track respectively. You may have already guessed, but if you were to change the height of one of these faders, then you will be adjusting the volume of the track that it's attached to. Watch how my kick drum gets quieter in comparison with the rest of the piece while I lower the fader. The idea is to tinker with these faders until your song sounds how you want, and while still being able to hear each part in the mix. Of course, certain parts you'll want to stand out a bit more, like your lead melody, but overall this is where you just have to use your own ears and tweak things how you think they sound best. However, this is usually the last thing I do, so let's come back to that later. Up above each track fader, you should see some boxes marked inserts and sends. Those are the two main ones that we'll use. Inserts are appropriately named. An insert is anything that you might want to insert into the track, like an audio effect, a compressor, or an EQ plugin. Note how the reverb effect I place in the insert box affects only the track that it's applied to. It's a bit different than the send box, which basically allows you to send your track audio elsewhere to be affected. For example, if I create an effects track with a basic reverb, I'll be able to apply a percentage of that effect to my individual tracks from this handy send slide bar. The more I increase the send amount, the more reverb makes its way into the final sound of this particular track. With that basic knowledge, I can now show you what I do to achieve the Triforce Films style of a cappella. I always start with EQs and compressors. Now, because you want each track to have a slightly different EQ or compression setup, you'll want to put them in the inserts. You can see I already have my favorite EQ plugin in all of my tracks. Not often that a track couldn't benefit from a bit of equalization to bring out the qualities that it needs to fit into a clean mix. EQ is not an easy topic to tackle. You can mess around and tweak with your EQ settings forever before feeling confident about what you did. The only advice I'll give you is don't overdo it. I've watched over the shoulder of other beginner engineers who will increase or decrease way too many points across the frequency spectrum until they've basically just turned down or turned up the whole track. 
solo your track and roll through the frequency band like this, listening to each frequency for something that stands out, good or bad. Then raise or lower that EQ point to where it sounds best. My vocal kick drum sounds best with this EQ layout, accentuating the low end for some boom, but with a small spike roughly here so that it has a pop, which allows you to hear it better in the mix. My snare drum EQ usually looks like this. EQ can be very overwhelming at first glance, so please avail yourself to some EQ presets. Most programs will have a number of basic EQ setups available for different instruments, vocals, etc. And then you can tweak each from there if you want. Again, remember that less is more, it's just a way of cleaning up your mix. Then you can move on to compression. I apply a compressor to only a few things, as all of my recordings have already gone through an outboard compressor. If you remember from last time, compression is a way of bringing out the quiet parts of your track while keeping the louder parts from distorting or being too loud. Because we're mixing only vocals, the dynamics and volume differences across our mix will be minimal, meaning that compression isn't required as often as it would be in a regular band recording. I usually put compression on my bass track and my lead vocal track. You could also try dropping a kick drum or a snare drum compression preset onto those tracks respectively as well. But I find that once I've EQ'd those drum parts well enough, compression isn't necessary. And just like EQ, it's best to keep tinkering to a minimum. The worst mistake that most inexperienced engineers can make is overly compressing their music. Really, anyone new to mixing can trick themselves into thinking that they created a great mix just by compressing the crap out of their music until everything is the same volume, loud. But what they don't know is that if you compress too much, you lose the depth of your sound. Light compression will maintain the dynamics of your music. The quiet parts can remain subtle and understated, and the louder bits will then seem relatively more powerful. You compress too much, and you deny your music the chance to grow or die down, to swell or build and then drop out. These moments of dynamics within a musical piece are its chance to really evoke feeling in the listener. Creating a tube of music that doesn't get louder or softer is meaningless, and louder isn't always better. Always give your music room to breathe. So next, we'll deal with our audio effects. Start by creating a couple effects tracks. A basic reverb, a basic delay, and I always drop in an effects track of a chorus as well. Reverb just makes it sound like it's happening in a lively room, sounding as if it were recorded in a hall or a church. Delay will give the impression of a bit of echo, also making you feel like you're hearing this in a live environment. Then the chorus effect I use to give a bit of subtle crunch to the sound, Oftentimes I'm doing a cover of a video game theme or a rock song that could benefit from that slightly distorted sound. You can do it the long way like I am by applying a send amount to each track. This gives you more control and it can be cleaner, but it's also a pain in the butt. If you want an easier method to start with, just look over here. At the end of your mix console is your final output. Every single music track goes through here for your final mix. If you apply some effects right into the inserts of your stereo output track, you'll hear them applied to every one of your tracks at once. This way is much simpler, and I used to do it a lot for my first several videos. But again, it doesn't offer the subtlety and control needed for a really clean, balanced mix. It's up to you to decide how much work you want to put into these steps. Start simple, maybe. And then when you have a few songs under your belt, go with the more complex approach. Now that you've applied EQ, compression, and effects where you like, you'll want to come over to your final output track again. Go up here to your inserts and apply a compressor. Adding a light master preset to your whole mix will fill in a few of the cracks in your mix and add a bit of polish. Then you want to add a limiter, which is a different kind of compressor. I'll usually set my input-output settings to about plus 0.3 and minus 0.3. This is just a subtle fail-safe to keep your mix from ever peaking or distorting. Make sure to keep your track faders low enough that they never peak. If you see the meters ever go past 0 dB, they'll turn red because you've pushed them too hard. They'll do what's called peaking, and this creates an unpleasant distorting sound. As a rule, I try to keep even the loudest parts from getting very high on those meters. 
So now that we have all these components in place, the idea is just to go back and listen to your whole song over and over. Adjust the levels of each instrument to your liking. Increase or decrease the amount of effects, perhaps, if they seem too subtle or too overwhelming. Try taking off your headphones and listening on your monitors. Listen for anything that stands out too much or is too buried. I sometimes have to listen to a song dozens of times before I'm really happy with the final mix. Just make sure to give your ears a break every couple of hours. After listening so closely to something for so long, you'll stop hearing the important details. You'll really thank yourself later for knowing when to take a break and come back to something after. So now you have the final version of your song. Do you remember when you made those videos of you singing the parts way back when in the last video? You have to gather all those files into one place because we're going to need them as we jump into the video half of Multitrack Acapella on our next episode of... It's Making Tunes with Mr. Deuce. Yeah.